Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for a Pearson-sponsored webinar. Tips for running an effective air conditioning lab. Before we begin, I'd like to point out a few housekeeping items. First, you have a control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. The orange arrow, top left, allows you to hide or expand this control panel. The round blue button allows you to move to full screen mode and back. Your control panel also has audio options. You are able to listen to the audio portion of this webinar through either your computer speakers or your telephone. Since we are recording today's session, all lines have been automatically muted. Next, please note that you have the ability to adjust the way the items on your screen appear. Use the layout drop-down at the top left of your monitor to make adjustments to your preference. To participate in the question segment, please type your question in the question box on your control panel and click Send. Feel free to send in questions at any time. I will be moderating throughout the duration of the webinar. With that said, I'm so happy to introduce our presenter for today, Carter Stanfield. Carter Stanfield, co-author of Fundamentals of HVACR, grew up in the air conditioning business in Athens, Georgia. He recently retired from Athens Technical College, where he taught for almost 40 years. Mr. Stanfield is still active in HVACR education, teaching part-time, writing, and speaking at educational conferences. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I will turn it over to you now. I hope everybody's having a good day. I would like to talk a little bit about some tips for running an effective air conditioning lab. Uh, I call it planning for success. I'd like to talk a little bit about people, for people that don't know me uh, about some of my background. I'm a licensed contractor in the state of Georgia. I'm also a member of RSES and I'm NATE certified in uh, several areas. My educational background, I have a Bachelor of Science in Education from the University of Georgia. Uh, I started college in 1973 and graduated in 1995, so I guess you could say I'm a slow learner. Uh, it, it took me a while with a, a little bit of a break in between there. I've been teaching at Athens Tech for uh, almost 40 years. I guess it actually is 40 years now. And uh, I am co-author of Fundamentals of HVACR, uh, the third edition, which just came out. You can connect with me. Uh, HVACRfundamentals at gmail.com. Uh, my personal email is just my name, Carter Stanfield at bellsouth.net. I do a blog. And I try to post about every week, uh, HVACRfundamentals.blogspot.com. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn and Facebook. I have a Google Plus account. I'm not as active on that. So, Carissa, I turn it over to you for our poll questions. Great. Thank you, Carter. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch this first poll question. All right, you should see it on your screen now. What is your role at school? Instructor, department head, administrator. Please vote now. Okay, we'll wait just a couple more seconds to give everyone a chance to vote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and let's look at the results. 80% responded instructor, 13% responded department head, and 7% responded administrator. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. I've got one more poll question for you so we can learn a little bit about you. And I'm going to go ahead and launch it. You should see it on your screen now. 
How much time do you spend each week preparing, grading, and documenting labs? Less than an hour, one to two hours, three to four hours, five to six hours, or more than six hours? Please vote now. And once again, we'll wait just a few seconds to give everyone a chance to vote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and let's look at the results. Okay, 7% responded less than an hour, 21% responded 1 to 2 hours, 50% responded 3 to 4 hours, 7% went with 5 to 6 hours, and 14% responded more than 6 hours. Okay, back to you, Carter. Well, it sounds like you're spending a lot of time planning, uh, which is good in a way, but there may be some time we can shave there by not recreating the wheel and doing the same things over and over again. So let's talk about some ways to avoid problems. So one of the first things you can do is plan. There we go. Okay. And detailed instructions, providing detailed instructions for your students helps. Uh, I have a, a little rule I call Carter's Rule of Specificity, which is the more specifically you tell someone what you want them to do, the better chance you have of them actually doing it. So you want to start off the semester right. That is part of where the planning comes in. When the students come in, it's really good to have all the paperwork, everything ready to go, so that they get the impression you know exactly where you're taking them, what everybody's going to be doing, and more importantly, they know what they're going to be doing. And then through the semester, you want to keep the course moving. Uh, again, planning helps with this because you don't run into big lulls where you're trying to figure out what am I going to do, what, how am I going to dig up a lab today, uh, what do we need to do, you've already laid that out. And then of course feedback, anytime you're doing any kind of a course or working on labs, feedback from the students, what seemed to work, what they had a hard time with, uh, is always helpful. So I like to think of navigating the semester it's kind of like taking a road trip. You need to know where you're going, primarily because if you don't know where you're headed, you might not like where you end up. How are you going to get there? If you just jump in the car and start driving without a map or GPS, the chance of arriving someplace that you want to be is really slim to none. So similarly, if you just kind of jump in and start doing stuff, uh, the chance of getting everything done that you want to do is really not too good. So how long will this take? How many times have you been on a trip and the children are either falling asleep or they're whining, when are we going to be there? Well, the students are exactly like that. They want to know when the quarter is going to be over, when they're going to be there. They want to know where they're at while they're going through the, the semester. Uh, so again, having a schedule, having a plan helps you show them this is where you are now, this is where you'll be next week, this is where you'll be at the end of the semester. And what are you going to need along the way? Chances are on any trip you're going to need some supplies. Well, if you're planning on installing split systems, you're going to need some copper pipe and some brazing and some uh, acetylene gas. You don't want to wait until you have to have those things to say, oh my gosh, I've got to put in three systems today or this week, and I don't have any of this stuff. How am I going to run around and get it? So having a layout of what you plan to do helps you also get kind of a shopping list of the stuff that you're going to need. And it, you know, realistically, if your shopping list exceeds your budget, then you may have to rework your plan and come up with something that you can realistically do. 
So planning involves knowing your goal, where you're headed, charting your path to arrive at that goal, developing a timeline so that you're getting there uh, in a reasonable way and so that you know that you're on track to get there, uh, and assembling the tools and resources required to achieve your goal. So a course plan, and these are really my ideas, but the course plan, the goal is that all students achieve the course objectives. Now, realistically, almost no courses do everybody achieve the course objectives, all the course objectives, but that really should be our goal. We want to make all the students successful. That doesn't mean that our goal should be uh, any less than what we really need it to be, but our goal should be to make everybody successful. Path, well, things like your addendum, your class schedule, your syllabus, your lab schedule, all of those things sort of lay out the path that you're going to take and the students will take in getting to the course objectives. What I call a course outline gives you the timeline. It tells you what happens each week. In some cases, it tells you what happens each day. Uh, I try to make my course outlines fit on one page, so I generally restrict my scheduling to a weekly basis just because if I go on a daily basis, then it, it runs over a page. And of course, resources, what text you're going to use, what lab manual. Uh, you don't have to use a text or lab manual, although obviously I prefer that you do. Uh, you can do your own material, but whatever material you're going to have, you should really have that all worked up and ready when the semester starts. Uh, also, any online material or LMS stands for learning management system. So if you're using Blackboard or Angel or, of course, my favorite, my HVAC lab that goes with my book, uh, but if you're using a learning management system, you should be comfortable with that learning management system and you should have uh, your courses for that learning management system and your material kind of already laid out. So you should have already gotten that I'm a believer in planning for the semester, the whole semester, not planning on a week-by-week -week basis. Uh, so you should have all your materials really ready to go. Now, that doesn't mean you can't modify your plan in the middle of the semester. Sometimes things happen that you don't have control over, uh, and you do need to modify it. However, it's easier to change an existing plan than it is to come up with a whole new one uh, on the spur of the moment when things are not going so well. So one of the main reasons for planning is to take you through the rough times. Uh, an analogy I might use, I, I am a musician and I, you know, I tell my kids that uh, the reason you practice is so that your worst is acceptable. In other words, don't expect that every time you play, what's going to come out is the best thing that you've ever done. Really kind of expect that the worst thing you've ever done is going to come out. So you practice so that your worst is acceptable. So you plan so that even in a worst case scenario, you know, you make it through. And some things that would be included in a plan would be like your course syllabus, uh, an addendum, and we'll talk more about a little bit about what an addendum really is, and a course outline which can include a lecture schedule, a lab schedule, and an assignment schedule. So syllabus, today, syllabi are really like legal documents. Uh, in many schools, much of the syllabus is already dictated by the school. Uh, a lot of boilerplate telling what you don't do and what you do and uh, legal wording that's required to be there by the school. Uh, at our school, any change to the syllabus has to be approved by the administrators. So uh, things that you may want to change on, on a semester-by-semester -semester basis are they're really kind of inconvenient to be in your syllabus because that means you have to keep uh, turning it in for it to be okayed by somebody. So when I went to school, the syllabus told you what you're going to read and, and when your assignments were due and the things that you needed to know to navigate through the 
quarter or the semester, but now it's really almost like a legal document. So we have to have other documentation to tell the students things like when their tests are, because by the time we get all the boilerplate in there, it runs several pages already. Uh, I really think we should be able to put in the student's hand a one or two page document that tells them really what they need to know to uh, get through the semester. I do have an example syllabus here. I'll go ahead and pull it up. So in this syllabus, uh, again, this is from the school that I worked at forever and the, where I still work. Uh, it gives your course number and the, the name, tells you things like your prerequisites and co-requisites. And for people that don't use co-requisites, what this means is that to take this course, AIRC 1010, you don't have to take AIRC 1005 before, but you have to at least take it at the same time. Uh, it's offered all terms, and it gives you the class hours, lab hours, and credit hours. And then we have a course description, and our school is part of a state system, so course descriptions and competencies and things are, again, they're pretty much set down by the state. Uh, and then, of course, we're listing the competencies and the outcomes. Now, I'm showing all this just to show the types of things that are in a typical syllabus today. So this is all description of what the course is about. And then we have the required textbooks. Uh, and we're also required to give an ISBN number for, for the books so that people, if they want to buy them somewhere besides the local bookstore, they can. Uh, they did let us get away with just saying tools per department list because our tool list runs a couple of pages and it would uh, balloon this even more. Grading scale, again, that's set by the school and pretty much everything after this is you know, set by the school, all the different school policies, uh, including things like continuation of, of instruction. And the idea of continuation of instruction is that if we have bad weather and we can't come to school, we still expect the students to do something if they can. And uh, this would be via our learning management system, which until recently has been Angel and now it's Blackboard. Uh, we talk about work ethics, academic honesty, anyway, the, you see what I mean by boilerplate. It goes on and on. And I understand why this needs to be here. I fear the effect on the students, though, is they look at it as a lot of stuff that they don't really want to look at. If I put all my assignments and things after all this, uh, or even before all this, it just the whole document gets a little bit unwieldy. I'm going to see if I can get back to my presentation here. So the addendum is where we have things that we have more control over and uh, that have more direct impact on what the students do as they go through the semester. So here's an example addendum. So here, th this is a uh, an Excel spreadsheet over on the left, we have we show the weeks and the dates for the weeks. Uh, we have a column for your text assignments and your online assignments. We put them both in the same column. We have a separate column for your quizzes and tests. Uh, over here, we're telling the students what each graded item is worth uh, out of a thousand. So here you can see all the written stuff, all the quizzes and tests adds up to 600, all the labs add up to 400. On the right side you see the labs for each week. And we do somewhere in a range of 20 to 30 labs for each course, uh, which is why we have, you know, essentially 50% of our time in labs, three hours lecture and three hours lab a week. Uh, so this document, though, tells a student most everything they're going to be doing through the, through the semester. 
also gives other things that they may need, like gives the My HVAC Lab course code so they can log into the My HVAC Lab, tells them who their instructor is, what their instructor's email is, how to call, uh, what days the class meets, what hours. So this, if you have this piece of paper right here, then you should have a pretty good idea of, of what's going on through the semester. I'm going to go back to the presentation. So course outline uh, is really similar. It is a really an older document. And the course outline, this is one that we came up with. Uh, and it does not tell everything. It does not give, for example, uh, the points that you get on everything. That was required by the school. Uh, but this is one in Word. What we were looking at before was in Excel. This is in Word uh, using uh, Word tables. Uh, if you've never worked with Word tables, uh, it can be frustrating. It can be really nice, the results, but it, can, it, it definitely is a little bit of a learning curve there. But again, you see, we're showing what's happening each week. In this one, we have a topic for the week. And we, again, tell the students what their assignments are. Uh, when we have uh, tests coming up, then we have that in bold. And <clears throat> uh, what units the test will cover. We usually have four or five tests through the semester. But again, the purpose of this document uh, is another way of showing the students what we expect them to do through the semester. I'll go back to the presentation. So I talked about a good portion of the grade being labs and essentially half the time being spent in labs. One of the problems that you run into with labs is how do you assign grades? There's two basic ways that I've seen people use to grade labs. Pass, fail. If it works, it passes. If it doesn't work, it fails. And then typical grades, standard grades, A through F. Well, the pass-fail system, one advantage of it is that it simplifies grading. You know, either it works or it doesn't. Uh, unfortunately, if that's your only standard, though, it can be kind of it can promote mediocrity because people sort of tend to find what's the minimum they can get by with. Or some students, I shouldn't say all students, many students tend to work towards the minimum. And the pass-fail, unfortunately, sort of uh, reinforces the minimum acceptable work, uh, which I kind of find is a problem. Traditional grades have the advantage of everybody understands what an A, B, C, or D is, and students actually like getting traditional grades. If they get any grade besides an A, then they are highly motivated to find out why. Now, the problem is that when you're grading a project, it can be difficult to determine exactly what the grade should be because it tends to be subjective. Uh, and because it is subjective, the grades can vary between instructors. And believe me, students figure out which lab instructor gives A's and which lab instructor gives C's. And the one that gives more C's than A's, he ends up not having as much business. So we have to have a way to solve this if we're going to try to give A's, B's, C's, and D's. And rubrics are how we came up with the solution. So what is a rubric? According to Webster, a rubric basically is a rule. And they, it goes into some specific types of rules here. But you see the first definition is a, an authoritative rule. Third definition is an established rule. And then the one, of course, we're using, a guide listing the specific criteria for grading or scoring academic papers, projects, or tests. So. That's the definition we're looking at. You could even replace this guide as a rule. A rubric is a rule as to how you're going to grade a particular project. So why use rubrics? Well, primarily to bring some objectivity to something that's inherently subjective. 
So having rules or having guidelines helps provide a framework for how you're going to determine the grade. You can show the students how their grade is determined. That's very important, especially if you give them anything besides an A. You give them a C, and the first thing you want to know is, why did I get a C? And it's difficult to just say, well, I've seen a thousand braised joints, and I can believe me, that one is not an A. You have to be able to say why it's not an A. Uh, rubrics help reduce the discrepancy between instructors. It'll never completely eliminate it, but it reduces it. And it generates defendable grades, meaning when you have to go to the administration and say, this is why I gave Johnny an F, and you can point to the things that uh, brought his grade down. So here's an example of a rubric. Uh, setting an ECM blower motor uh, using the speed board. So we have five standards here. These would be the uh, criteria that we're judging on. And the ones we picked for this were preparation, interpreting instructions, setting speeds, measurements, and safety. Now, our guidelines tell us how we determine if we're going to give them a 5, 4, 3, 2, or 1 in preparation, although these are what I call outer limits. If they cannot explain anything about the lab, they get a 1. If they can explain everything about a lab, they get the 5. Now, when we say explain uh, about the lab, we expect them to have read the lab and be able to tell us what they're going to do before they go into the lab. If they can't, well, then they're down here in the one range. And depending on the lab, they may have to go back and read it because uh, you know, some things it's just not safe to send somebody out there who really has no idea what they're doing. Interpreting instructions, again, the outer limits cannot explain anything about the instructions or can explain everything that the instructions give them. So this would be the instructions in the manufacturer's manual or on the unit. Setting speeds, can they actually set the speeds? So they cannot make any settings on the blower board correctly. That's a one. They can make all the settings on the blower board correctly. Well, then that would be a five. Now I think you, you get the gist of it here. Uh, five things, five times five would be 25, times four would give you 100. So that's how we're getting our grade. We're just adding up these columns, multiplying the total by four to get the grade. So standards can be characteristics of the process used, characteristics of the finished product, the time it takes to finish, or the number of attempts uh, required. They need to be definable. You need to be able to say specifically what you're looking at. Observable, you need to be able to observe what it is. And measurable, you have to have some way to measure it. So steps to creating a standard, you have to determine what standards you're going to use. Uh, you have to determine a weight for each standard, determine a scale, and the one we looked at, at the five, but there are certainly many other scales that you can use, and determine how you're going to assess each one. If you have too few standards, uh, you really get an incomplete idea of what, what the job is. Uh, too many can make the grading as difficult as if we didn't have the rubric. We tend to use five. Uh, I consider four kind of an absolute minimum and ten really kind of a maximum. So the weight, just because you have five standards does not mean each has to represent 20%. Uh, you can... Uh, weight a more important standard more, so you could have four at 15% and one at 40% if, if you were looking for uh, to, to make one area more important than another. I do find, however, making all of them equal weight uh, makes the math easy. Scales, we use one to five. Uh, Another one we have used is 1 to 10. We've even used 0 to 25. Then there's you know, letter grades, A, B, C, D, or F, or descriptors, superior, excellent, good, fair. 
thing about these, the letters or the descriptors, you still have to turn those into numbers to average them. Uh, so I just go with numbers. Uh, sometimes people want to know why are you making one the bottom number instead of zero. And my thinking there is just that I want to differentiate between someone that at least attempted the lab and failed versus somebody that made no attempt. So to me, someone that made no attempt is a zero. Someone that at least showed up but you know, failed in every respect, well, they get a little bit more than the person that did not even show. So ways to assess each standard, you can have upper and lower limit examples, which uh, is what you saw in the example we looked at earlier. Uh, you can have examples for every step on the scale. So if you have uh, a scale of five, you can have five examples for each one. Uh, if you're doing time, frequency, or repetitions, then you can specify the time. So if it takes you 10 minutes to do this task, you get an A. If it takes you 20 minutes, you get a B, and so on. Frequency, if you're doing something repetitively and seeing how often you're successful, uh, you can say uh, student 9 out of 10 times is able to do this, and that, that's, you know, that's a 5, and then uh, student eight out of ten times is able to do it, or seven out of ten times, maybe that would be a four. So you can specify the frequency out of different repetitions. Uh, and then repetitions, how many times does it take to do it? So if you're letting them do whatever the task is until they're able to complete it, then you could possibly set the grade on how many times it took. If they get it the first time, they get an A. If it takes, you know, three times, they get a C, and so on. Uh, some things you really can't just give them an F and tell them to go on. For example, lighting an oxyacetylene torch, they have to be able to do that successfully and safely before they can go on. It makes no sense to say, well, you can't light a torch, but why don't you go on to the bracing job? For one thing, I'm standing in the same lab where they're using the torch, and the life that they save by learning to do it might be mine. So uh, I'll take a quick look at a couple of lab sheets that we've used. So when we developed these lab sheets, the idea was we'd give them a sheet each week. So in a 15-week semester, there would be like 15 sheets, and they would hand in each sheet at the end of the week. Uh, sometimes there would only be one lab in the week, so we have this one rubric here for this first week using hand tools. And you can see some of the standards, manual dexterity, parts positioning. Comprehension tended to be uh, if they demonstrated they understood what they were doing. And that's a little squishy in terms of the uh, observable part. Uh, independence was how much help they needed, whether they can do it themselves or not. And of course, safety, do they follow all the outlined practices? So next week, we have two labs. So you see we have two rubrics. And the idea would be, that as the student does the lab, we would tick off the lab and grade it. And then when they do the next lab, possibly on a different day, we would tick off and grade that. And then they would turn it in at the end of the week. I'm going to pull up the other lab sheet. I wanted to show this one because it had a slightly different approach. Here, now one thing you can see, we're probably loading them down too much on the first week. We're giving them five labs on the first week, which uh, we no longer do. But you can see right here, in these four labs, basically, are similar, they're just with different types of compressors. So every one of them, they're going to disassemble, they're going to identify parts, they're going to reassemble, and so all our standards are the same. So what we did is we just spread this out so that we made extra column, one column for each lab. So basically this one uh, form right here can handle four labs. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get all the labs on one sheet. And, and it, sometimes we do use more than one sheet, but it's really nice to add in just one sheet for the week. All right, back to the presentation. 
So, here's the problem. 15 lab sheets per course, 10 different courses, and we teach every course, every semester. An average of 20 students per course. It goes up to 30, uh, but probably an average would be around 20. That's 3,000 lab sheets. And guess who was collecting, collating, uh, managing, recording all those lab sheets? Well, that was me. Uh, so I'm sitting there as I'm shuffling the lab sheets for hours thinking, I've made a mess. You know, I've made my own problem. Uh, so my solution is to automate. I use rubrics on Excel. So what we did is we put the rubrics on Excel spreadsheet, and that makes all of the, the handling goes away, basically. Now we're recording everything electronically. And I'll pull up this uh, the latest one. We've been through several iterations. We've been using... Uh, the rubrics in Excel for a little over a year, and I tweaked the program pretty much every semester. I think I finally gotten it to a point where uh, it's pretty easy for anybody to use, not just me. So the problem was that that I was really having to go in and and reload the. Uh, the Excel file and the rubrics every semester, and uh, since I'm not there all the time now, we really need something that doesn't require that. So to give you an overview of how this works, you select the instructor's name here by clicking on the yellow box of the instructor, and then you pick the instructor who's going to give the grade. You select the student by clicking on the student box, and this, of course, would be the student that you happen to be grading. And then you select the lab by clicking on the yellow box and, and clicking on the lab and then click select and it pulls that lab up right here. Now over here you're going to see the current week. So the current week in this semester is week 13 for us. The lab that I just selected though was for week 11. So you notice there's a penalty down here. Now if I stay with fours all the way across. Remember, we're on a one to five scale. They would get an 80 for a grade, but a 30 penalty, so that what would be recorded would be a 50 for a grade. Now, if they did a little better than average, then, well, I can click on my little drop-down arrow and give them a five. Uh, if their calculations weren't maybe quite up to par, I could go with a three. Uh, Hopefully their safety was excellent, so I give them a five on that. Now their score is 84. Then when I'm ready to record the grade, you just click record grade, and it says post grade for student four uh, for lab. It gives you the lab. So the reason we have this little dialog box is that we found if we weren't careful, we'd start clicking in grades, and we hadn't selected the, the student or uh, you know, we were grading them on the wrong lab. So this is, you know, just a, a warning. You know, do you really want to post this grade for this particular student in this particular lab? If so, you say yes. Tells you the grades reported. It shows you uh, the grade that it, it shows you basically what it emails to the student. Uh, so every time you do this, if you have put in the student's emails in a, in a tab, I'll show you in just a second. Uh, it sends the student an email as well. If in selecting the lab, you want to go to the first lab for this current week, just click go to this week, and it goes to that lab. And you can go to next lab or previous lab uh, using those buttons. Now, if a student wants to know what all their grades are, you go to the report tab, and notice this is a tab spreadsheet. The blue tabs are the ones you're going to use during the term. Click on the student's name, select the student, and you click Run Report. And it should bring up a report of all the, the grades for student four. And student four doesn't have too many grades, the, pretty much the one we just put in. 
if I wanted instead to know grades for student one, I've put more in for him. He's got more grades. Now, at this point, you can print this out and give it to him, or you can email it to them. And at the end of the semester, here are your students, and here are your averages right here. Uh, up here are all the labs, and there's more than can show, so you have to scroll through to see all of them if you're trying to look through and see the details. This shows the lab names. If you click expand, it opens up and it shows the date, you know, and all the uh, uh, different standards that we use for the rubric. You can click shrink and they're back. So this is where we pull the grades at, at the end of the semester. Uh, the green tabs help you set it up for the semester. Banner is the name of a program that we use at our school for managing uh, the, uh, or really managing all the, the student, uh, well, I'm drawing a blank on a word here, but managing the student uh, registration. And this tab is literally just for copying and pasting the roster for the class. The people tab is where you're going to cut and paste and put the students, and here is where you would put the uh, the email if for the student email. Our school gives every student uh, their own specific school email, and all electronic communication with them is done through that way. So the program looks when you grade the student to see if there is a uh, uh, an email listed there, and if there is, it sends that grade that we saw to the student uh, via email. You list all the instructors here, and then you can you can change. I've got the maximum penalty for being late set at 50, and the penalty for per week at 10. You can change this, uh, and that's the people tab. Lab list. Uh, shows the uh, contents of, of the lab manual for the third edition. So over here on the left, you see the contents for the third edition. There's 340-something labs. So what you do when you're trying to lay out your labs for the semester, you just put the lab, the, the sequence number uh, beside each lab. So this would be the first lab, and then skipping down here, this would be the second lab and the third lab. There's no rhyme or reason to these numbers. I was just playing with the numbers to make sure the program worked. Uh, it could do up to 40 labs. Uh, so you just put your sequence 1 through 40 or 1 through 20, <coughs> excuse me, or however many labs you want. And you put the first due date right here, and uh, here you want to put the lab, the week that you want each lab done. So if you want to do lab one in the first week, and lab two in the second week, and lab three in the third, and then you see here they also did lab four in the third, and lab five in the third. So you put the week that you want it done here. Uh, then you click load labs, and essentially then loads the, the lab list so that you can uh, select your labs right here. That's really all there is to setting it up for the semester. You copy and paste your roster here. Uh, copy from that roster, then you would copy the people, paste them here, copy the emails if you had that in your roster, and paste them here. Uh, type in your uh, instructor names, adjust your penalty if you don't like those, and then the lab list, um, make out your, your lab, which labs you want, 1 through 40, uh, and which weeks you're going to do those labs, and click load labs, and you're set up for the semester. And I think that gets me close to done with my presentation. Uh, I do have some resources 
uh, the survival kit, if you, if you uh, click on this link, of course you can't click on that link, this tiny URL should take you to it. Uh, and that is a, a, a Google Drive, a, a publicly shared drive has a lot of this, a lot of the documents and uh, schedules and things on it. The, the Excel program I was just looking at should be here. Uh, and then the uh, resources for the new edition of the third edition uh, would be right here. And at that, I think we're up to questions. And I'll actually go back to that slide in case people are looking at that. So, Carissa, I think I'm done with my presentation. Now we can entertain questions. Great. Thanks, Carter. Okay, well, we have had some questions come in. Um, here's our first question. What do I do if my lab is not moving at the same pace as my outline? Okay, well, obviously it's better if your lab is moving at the same pace as your outline. But uh, one thing you can always do is try to, try to adjust looking at what you've got coming up. Uh, the, the, the once you make an outline, that's not set in stone. It's just uh, it's kind of your roadmap. So you know, if the bridge is washed out that you're going to head to, uh, you're going to just look at your map and, and find another way. So in terms of your lab movement, you may have to uh, jettison some labs or combine some. And of course, if that happens to you, then you want to make a note so that next semester you don't make the same mistake. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, here's our next question. I see that EPA testing was on the calendar. Is the testing included in tuition or is there an additional charge? Uh, it's included. We don't charge our, our students uh, for EPA testing. Uh, and that it also, you might notice, that's a fairly early course. It's only the second of our refrigeration courses. Uh, but no, we do not. Well, I, I take it back. We don't charge extra, but we expect the students to pay for uh, the testing fees. So for the testing agencies that we use, they charge $25, and the students pay that $25. They don't pay it to the school, though. They pay it to the, the testing people that we use. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, here's our next question. How do I bring in new resources after the semester starts? Well, uh, it, essentially, you can look at where your, uh, the weeks that you're planning on using what that resource would, would address, and try to either add it to what you've already got, or in the case of you've got a resource that's better than what you've got, then you would just replace it. Again, the, the schedules are not absolute. Uh, you want to be able to be flexible enough to improve things when you can, and usually students are pretty receptive to that. Uh, just it really helps if they have an idea of where you're headed every week. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, here's our next question. Um, it makes me nervous to use electronic records. How do you back up electronic records such as Excel files? Well, that makes me nervous too. And uh, I did think about that quite a lot. Uh, so our system, our, our, and so far it's worked out for us, is number one, when we grade a student on the lab, we write down the grade in their lab manual. And we emphasize to them that that lab manual with the instructor's signature on it, on every lab page, that's their backup record. So in an absolute worst case scenario, and this would be horrific, but all the students would bring in their lab manuals and we'd have the grade from there. Now what we do to back up the electronic records is we have you know, an external drive plugged into the computer that we use for those records and we have you know, a backup program that backs up the files uh, every day. So we shouldn't get more than a day off anyway. OK. OK. Um, thank you. Well, I think that uh, wraps up our questions for today. Oh, wait. Looks like we've got one more coming in. 
It says, can we use the Excel rubrics document as a template and make changes accordingly to meet our needs? Uh, sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, something I didn't say in there, uh, I, I didn't show that the, some of the setup tabs, but you could basically, you know, change the the, the labs in, in the, some of the back tabs. As a matter of fact, let's see here. So these tabs here, the, the, like the, the purple ones, this is the rubrics list. And what you can do, for one, I've got a place for 20 new labs here. So you can put your own labs in there without having to, to type over the ones that are already in there. However, you could also do that. You could type over what's in there. You would just have to unprotect the uh, page. It's protected, but it's not password protected. Uh, one thing to realize is that a lot of the stuff that it does, it does based on uh, uh, macros. And so you'd have to be a little careful about what you change, because if you change some things like deleting rows and columns and certain tabs, uh, the mac you'd break the macro. So what I'd recommend is, you know, make a copy of the file and then from that copy make your changes so that you could always go back to the original if stuff didn't work out. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, well, that wraps up our questions. I just want to say thank you so much for your time today, Carter. We appreciate you being here. And thank you to all the attendees that have joined us for the session. Please take a moment at the end of this webinar to give your feedback in the survey provided. A follow-up message and link to the recording of this webinar will be emailed out to all participants within a few days. Please feel free to share with your colleagues. Thank you for your time and have a great afternoon.